as the AT&Ts or the Verizons, we could still, as small carriers, play a big part in combating fraud. And I, I kind of want to take you through a little bit of how we, or my idea, on how to combat fraud. So, Sarah, if you go to page two, slide two, mm -hmm. I basically have to, you know, tell you who we are as Frontier, what we offer. You know, we offer residential and business services. Um, we have, you know, a lot of POTS network, primarily we're POTS, we're moving more and more to the, the VoIP world. So VoIP is relatively new, I guess, to us, where most carriers are really pushing, you know, a VoIP platform. We're slowly phasing into that. Um, we offer, you know, we have some small business enterprise customers. We have some very large business enterprise <laughs> customers. We have a very large residential I base. I think we lost you, Heather. Can you hear me? Did anyone else hear her? Yeah, I can hear her. Oh, okay, maybe it's me. It's you. No, I'm kidding, Amber. Um, <laughs> can everybody else hear me, I'm guessing? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Um, so if you move forward to the next map, it's just our footprint. And our, our footprint shows you at that time we're in 29 states. We're in the process of selling off four states in the Midwest, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana. So at that point, we'll only be in 24 states, which has been taking up a lot of my time right now is that sale. Um, so when I first got in the fraud world about 19 years ago, I thought fraud, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. And I started here at AT&T and Mark Z speak about this fraud and, you know, work with the FBI and all this stuff. So this is how I envision, if you go to the next screen, slide four, that's how I envision my fraud world to be. And thanks to Mark Z from AT&T, these are pictures that he provided me. This is him actually out in the Philippines on a raid. He's going through some of the notebooks. And then the other picture there, are the actual hackers getting fingerprinted. So, you know, my vision of doing fraud was, you know, I'd be like an FBI agent out there arresting people and going after everybody. And my goal is still to get somebody arrested. It hasn't happened yet, but that's my goal. So if you go to the next screen, my reality is actually this. Kick it back with my feet up on my desk. I don't have the exciting life that Mark has but don't show my bosses this photo because I actually do do stuff during the day. I don't just sit back with my feet up on my desk. Um, so that's what I envision my world in fraud to be versus what my world actually is. So if you go to screen slide six, please. And, and this is where I think it's really interesting. When we go to these conferences, I'm always asking, well, where's your fraud team lie? Or, or how many people are in your fraud team? And, you know, from every, depending on the size of the carrier, you get all different answers. A lot of people are in, you know, revenue assurance on the finance side of things or collections. You have some customer service reps. So our fraud team is really made up of two different teams. We have the network fraud prevention team, which is my team. I have six individuals. The average tenure is 25 years, so I have some really seasoned people on my team. And my people are extremely technical. They know, especially on the POT side in the TDM world, they know translations for DMS switches like the back of their hand. Um, we have multiple switch types, and they are very proficient in every one of those switch types. Um, so my team not only monitors for fraud, we also troubleshoot any long distance repair tickets that come through for a frontier LD calling. So my team has dual function. So they troubleshoot and they also monitor for fraud. On the flip side, we have a second team which is in collections, which is under our collections and revenue assurance organization. And there are a team of eight folks and what they do is they handle all the customer contact. So my team will monitor the fraud system, we'll get alerts for things, We'll determine if, you know, by looking at customers' invoices, past calling history, this is legitimate or this is kind of suspicious, you know, we might need to check with the customer first, or we definitely know it's fraud. And from there, my team initiates all blocking, and we send an alert to our collections team to say, hey, you need to reach out to this customer. That team then reaches out to the customer, they do handle all the documentation, you know, hey, this is Frontier, we've seen unusual usage on your lines, calling, say, the Philippines, um, please verify this legitimate usage. And then if it is fraudulent usage, there's different steps we have the customer go through to secure their phone system, and then if they want to come back for the credit process, there's a whole bunch of other steps involved. Um, my team basically oversees to say, okay, this is the documentation you should be sending to the customer. This is the verbiage we want to use. Um, we kind of help them establish the credit process, but as far as any customer interaction, that team does all that. 
Does anybody have any questions? Is everybody still here? Can everybody still hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, it's just different right. being on a call when I'm used to seeing people and, you know, seeing their reactions and, you know. Um, so basically this is how my team is set up. And if you go to the next screen, please. The big part of what we do is based on where we are in that hierarchy. So for some folks, like, um, that might have customer service reps looking at their fraud alerts. They probably have the fraud system. It passes the records to them. They look at the alerts. They determine if it's fraud or not, and they either press a button in their fraud system to implement blocking, or they reach out to the customer. And, you know, a lot of the carriers we talk to or who do presentations are basically, you know, we're a customer of that carrier. So say, for instance, I'm just going to use AT&T because they're well-known and they're a big player in this. So say Frontier could be a customer of AT&T's. So when AT&T speaks about a customer, when they're doing their presentations or doing about fraud, they're talking about, for example, say Frontier in a lot of cases, where we're their customer. When I speak of a customer, I'm talking about an actual end user. I'm talking about, you know, Bob and Kathy's barbershop, you know, um, or I'm talking about Rose's residential home phone. So for me, my customers are a little bit different than what a lot of these bigger carriers say that their customers are. And in that case, I have a little bit more control over what's coming into our network because I'm actually providing not only the LD service for that customer, I'm actually providing the dial tone for that customer. And I, I know on many of the presentations, so if you look at my screen, you'll see the home phone, you'll see the Frontier van, you'll see our LD switch, and then you'll see carrier A, carrier B, carrier C. So a lot of times when we talk about monitoring fraud, we're talking about going after the bad guys, which is beyond the carriers A, B, and C. We're looking at the term end or blocking the term end. Because my team is very technically savvy, we like to look at the beginning of the call. We like to look what can we do within our network where we're originating dial tone to help you know, tighten that tunnel, tighten that avenue for fraud. We're not going to stop all the fraud, but at least we're not going to allow as many call forward pass. And that's a lot of stuff that maybe some of those big carriers, when, when like Frontier is a wholesale customer of theirs, they can't control. But me as Frontier being a smaller carrier, I have that control. <clears throat> so when I say, you know, we may be smaller, but we have a big part to play in this fraud. We can't just rely on the AT&Ts and the Verizons and the CenturyLinks to battle this and, you know, fight that far end. We as smaller carriers can turn around and look behind us and say, okay, how can we help in this battle? And what can we do in this battle? So... For me being in a position I'm in where my team is over the long distance translations, we look at things a little bit differently. So I work closely with our long distance engineering team. So when it comes to putting a new carrier in our mix, say for least cost routing, they come to me and say, okay, Heather, we're bringing carrier A into the mix because their cost came back as this, their pricing came back as this. Now, because I'm involved in the industry so much, I know just like any customer service you rep you get, some are better than others, and some are better at, you know, call quality than others. Some are better at fraud monitoring than others. So when it comes to making a decision on what carriers are going to go into our network for terminating some of our traffic when we hand it off, I have a big say in that. And that really helps when it comes to our fraud because I know some carriers are better at alerting and monitoring for fraud than other carriers. And this is just added protection on top of what we already monitor because we already have a fraud monitoring system but, you know, more eyes, you know, four eyes are better than two eyes. So the more visibility we have on our traffic and the more alerting we get, the better off we're going to be in stopping that leakage. So a big part for us is really working with our engineering folks to say, okay, hey, you know, Carry Air came in the mix and they can handle our international termination. Their prices are great. And I might say, but right now fraud to these particular areas are hot. I don't want them handling it because I know Carrier B is better at monitoring fraud. So my team's able to break out those ratings and routing rules, and we're able to force traffic to certain carriers. And a lot of what we do, not only off of cost, but based off of fraud monitoring capabilities when we see fraud. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any comments? Um, no. no. So that's a big thing we do. We don't just look in front of us. We look behind us. Um, another thing we do, if you go to the next screen, 
is there are a lot of things that carriers can control, especially for when you're a dialed home provider, that most people don't think about. So one big thing that we've done is we've looked at call forward paths. There's no reason when you're programming a line that a residential line needs 50 call forward paths on the line. So we've gone back to some of our, you know, end offices and we've added some software because we found that in one particular acquisition we had, we acquired um, a lot of Centrix customers. And one of the things with Centrix customers is programming Custopack to, on their lines to give them the ability for all the Centrix functionality. Well, we found out after getting hit with all this fraud that these custom packs allowed for a limited amount of call forward paths, which we were not in favor of. There's no need for that. And that's we were getting hit hard with fraud because they were just putting up call after call after call. So we had to go back to the vendors and we had to purchase, it came out of cost to purchase software, but the cost of the software far outweighed the cost of the fraud we're experiencing. And by that, doing that software, we were able to limit the number of call forward paths that were allowed on some of those custom pack features. Um, another thing we've done, of course, is voicemail out dials. Um, you know, when product people come aboard, you know, they want to give every bell and whistle for everything and they make the, the product as robust as possible. But a lot of people don't even use some of the functions. So we stopped voicemail out dials to any international Caribbean destinations. Um, Another big thing is call forwarding. We stopped call forwarding to any 011, and we've also since then added blocking call forwarding to one plus domestic, domestic region, so like the Caribbean places of that nature that do not require a 011. Um, we've also worked closely with our product folks to limit some of the functionality of the web portals we give, because initially we were giving out a web portal to everybody who had a voicemail off a certain platform. And we found out that only 2% of those actual residential customers were using that portal. So we were paying a license fee for the portal as well as having all these portals out there that weren't even used by the consumer. So we did a lot with cleaning a lot of that up. We're still in the process of cleaning that up with our IT folks. Um, we've gone in and we've blocked a lot of user agents. So we only allow certain devices to register on our network. and you know that list is constantly growing and changing, and I'm constantly battling our engineering team to do something with those user agents. Um, we're in the process now of rolling out a, a new pin security feature for our voicemail platform, because um, you know our product people are always wonderful when they say they're going to launch a new product or a new voicemail, and the password is going to be some form of the telephone number or 1234. So we have um, installed some new software on our voicemail platform and right now we're going out and we're forcing customers across the country to change their passcode and the system will only allow them to use a certain 6 to 13 digit, um, nothing sequential, not part of the telephone number. So we're, we have to force that across the board. And that's been challenging because we have to work with our call center folks because they, you know, they want, don't want to drive calls into the call center um, and take away from other issues for our customers or selling a product to our customers. So we, we've been trying to balance that out with our care centers on rolling that out and that change to our customers. Um, now we've decided we've default blocked all our VoIP customers. So uh, a business subscriber that comes aboard with Frontier and they want SIP services, they're automatically default from international calling. And my team is the only team in the company who can open a line up. So a request will come to my team saying, hey, listen, this customer wants to call international. Um, there are certain checklists that customers are still on their contract with us, and then we, my team will go in and open up their international calling for VoIP subscribers. But initially, by default, they're all blocked. So that was a big change we made. Um, could you please go to the next slide? So the big thing for us, like I said, we're, we're not going to be the AT&T. I don't have a, a, a center full of people, and I don't have certain investigators. Like I, I don't have whizzes like Mark Z who can actually put a case together for me. Our losses are, are you know, significant, but they're not to the point where law enforcement wants to get involved. I mean, we may reach out to the AT&Ts and say, hey, have you been seeing this going on? And they might say, hey, we have a case. We could say, hey, can we attach some of our losses to your case? And then we usually don't hear anything from that then on. But as far as our perspective, I just want the middle of the line carriers, I know Stacy and I have had this discussion before too, if we could just turn around behind us and say to those carriers downstream, like if the AT&T's turned around and said to Frontier, hey listen, 
you, there are steps that you could take within your network to help stop some of this fraud, and like some of the steps we've taken with our end users. Um, you know, it's collaboration across the board. We've we have started now um, more rampant education of our technicians. So every year, technicians go through a course. You know, like every employee, we have our ethics training we have to go through. So we are in the process of building a training for our technicians. Every technician, not even just our CPE technicians to address fraud, to discuss some vulnerabilities that are in different systems or different pieces of equipment, and the need to speak to a customer. Um, you know, probably most of the hackings we have are because of a customer maintained and owned phone system, which we cannot control. Our technicians won't touch that like with everybody else. Um, it's up to their vendor to secure that phone system. But at least we're giving our technicians the material and the tools to talk to our customer. When they go out there to install, say, a, a PRI, and the customer's waiting for their vendor, our technicians will have the language and have you know, the ability to speak to a customer saying, hey, when your vendor does come out here to install a phone system, make sure he takes security measures. Because 98% you know, of this is really educating the consumer on what could happen. And they're relying on us to provide them that information. So if we can help get rid of three or four cases a month, that's a huge cost savings to a carrier because some of these cases can really add up. Um, the one hard line we've taken with our technicians is that in no way should a frontier phone system ever get compromised. Our technicians should be well educated enough, so we, we've really done a lot with our field techs now to really drive home the fraud, especially to our CPE techs that are installing the phone equipment, what they can do. Because I've had times where I've called our own technicians and say, hey, you installed this phone system, you know, did you do A, B, and C? And the tech's like, well, I didn't know what fraud was. I didn't know fraud could occur. I've been doing this for 40 years. I had no idea. So, you know, we have a lot of the field techs out there who have just been around for a really long time who just aren't aware of what's going on. Um, we've done a lot of collaboration with our internal audit team. You know, everybody cringes like, oh, my God, internal audit's calling you. This is a bad thing. It's a good thing. You know, internal audit is looking for process improvements, any leakage, they know companies are going to have fraud every year, but do you have your checks and balances in line? And if things are, are not working out for you, you're not getting the support from maybe the engineering team or the product team that you need, internal audit is there to help you close that gap and push that along. So they're not your enemy in the fraud world, they're your friend. They want to help you close those gaps. Um, we work a lot with our corporate security folks, our vendor management folks, our collections folks, and like I said, our operations folks with our technicians. And now we've also established a monthly call with these different teams to discuss the different fraud trends. So I might not handle um, identity theft. Like my fraud team doesn't handle that. We only handle voice fraud. But because of me being involved in the CFCA and having the resources out there in the industry to talk about this, I might have a little more knowledge on identity theft and what other carriers are doing to combat it that I can bring back to our corporate security folks when they're dealing with one of these cases. So. Within Frontier, we've done a lot of collaboration. We have a long way to go. Um, but like I said, I just don't want the other carriers to feel, when you're a smaller carrier, you know what, there's a big part we could do to help this. We don't have to put this everything on at and shoulders or Verizon shoulders or CenturyLink shoulders. You know, we have control of that end user. We have control of their dial tone. So there's just a lot in our end that we can do.